So let me start by introducing Mark Ludwig, who as a sign member has been very helpful in putting together these programs. So he's a musician, a scholar, and really has focused on the Holocaust as a subject. And he's been the uh, executive director of the Terezin Music Foundation. Um, and um, Mark, you may want to talk about that at some point. Dr. Anna Ornstein, um, a professor of child psychiatry. Um, she also has taught at uh, Harvard Medi Medical School as a lecturer in psychiatry. And um, she says, as a Holocaust survivor, I am deeply concerned with the survival of the memory of this catastrophic event. It is my conviction that the survival of any historical event can be assured only when such events become transformed into various forms of art. And so without further ado, Mark and Dr. Ornstein, take it away. Well, welcome to everybody. Thank you for uh, taking time and I uh, hope you have a cup of coffee with you um, as we go through today. It's going to be an informal discussion, but we're dealing on issues of memory and loss. And Anna, over the years, we've had many conversations exploring it. What I'd like to do is start the first the first section. I want to read something from, um, I think all of you are familiar with her wonderful book, My Mother's Eyes, which um, in our first program, going back several months ago, we were talking about your family members. We looked at a whole selection of beautiful photos and we got to speak about each of them while reading excerpts. Um, I want to focus on loss and, and read something from your mother's eyes. This is uh, from the section entitled, it's titled Dedication. Renewal is not forgetting. Renewal comes from an ever deep, deeper appreciation of memories that link the past with the present. <clears throat> Our lives are finite, but museums, monuments, books, letters, pictures, and stories told by parents to their children, and they go on living at least for a while. As grandparents, we had become increasingly more conscious of representing a very small link in the chain of generations of Jews that by miracle survived the attempt at all out destruction. I am also extremely proud that our children had become heirs to the ethical and moral values that had guided many previous generations through their turbulent lives. I wanna focus on this. Nothing could give us greater strength to face the infirmities and illnesses that are inevitable with age than this pride and this knowledge. And we've talked about loss, of course, through the show up. Right. We talk about memory, but I'd like to, at, at this stage in your life, you were talking to me recently about loss to you and what you encounter. Could you share that? Yeah, you know, these are losses that come up very gradually. So we don't notice them. We don't realize that our memory, for example, is getting a little bit uh, more restricted, that we don't remember things as well as we used to. Or more importantly for me in my experience was that I forget names. I am very familiar with abbreviation, you know, that is very common that people say, eh, da, 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 you know, and everybody's supposed to know what you are referring to, because these are abbreviation of certain things. But with your uh, age, and I better, better tell people how old I am, so they know that <laughs> I had a long time to forget things. <laughs> I am 97 years old or about to become, and so it is easy to forget many things in your life. And so when I am now coming on a program and I'm expected uh, 
to talk about things, certainly things that I ought to remember. But please, my wonderful audience, do remember that with age, one forgets. And one of the things, and that bothers me, I am really very conscious of the fact that uh, names, the names of people, of uh, certain things that everybody knows and remembers, and suddenly I forget. It's very, very uh, disturbing. And uh, because I am now a pe uh, in a way excusing myself right away uh, to tell you that that may happen as we go along with that program, uh, I will make every effort to remember, but it's not up to me. My mind work has its own uh, ideas and sometimes I forget and sometimes I do. Mm. But you've talked about the spirit too, and we've had discussions about acceptance versus resistance. Yeah, no. Oh, thank you, Mark. What you are telling me, Mark, that with age, I should accept, accept this fact that with age we do forget. And that acceptance is not easy. You know, uh, I thought that I, I, I'm fairly well educated and I know many things at, uh, about memory, but I do um, experience some kind of what I would call shame. Isn't that terrible that one could be ashamed for getting something? But that is the effect. That is the experience because you have been a person who knew so much. I, meant, I went to medical school. I uh, lived a long life. But that doesn't mean that my mind is actually accepting the losses that I had suffered over the years. Mm. And, and as you're going through this, like to go back and, and if I'm uh, touching on too sensitive an area, you'll let me know, of course. Yeah. But of course, um, after you had the stroke, you had to once again, in a sense, rebuild yourself skill-wise, Correct. right? Correct. Uh, could we talk a little bit about that? Yes, yes. No. Uh, when I, uh, and I say that very quickly because the details are uh, not important right now, but um, I had uh, an experience when I was in the hospital attending a meeting and it, in that, it was in that, the course of that event when we were writing a book together with a group of people, my family, uh, that I had a stroke. And that was totally unexpected from everybody, certainly. But the stroke occurred in the hospital, which meant that they took me right away to the OR, or the operating room, and removed the damaged uh, tissue. And uh, that meant that I had an opportunity, and as you can hear now, um, go into rehabilitation, which was, um, it took maybe a whole year. I, I really don't remember, but the rehabilitation was a process uh, that had a great deal uh, with my memory coming back. Now, let me also add to that, that while, yes, indeed, I did recover quite a bit about my memory, which doesn't mean that I also didn't forget a great deal. So uh, either you, Mark, or somebody from the audience will say, oh, Dr. Orishin, I heard you talk about this thing or another. Can you remember that again? Or could you say more about it? And I will try. Uh, but I may not remember and cannot uh, tell you that. But I am also very happy that many people have heard me speak at various occasions about many things which included uh, memory, 
and the loss of memory. But um, in that process, we're in your rehabilitation. Um, so you were regaining, and I, I was with you through a lot of to, to watch this, and I could observe not only the courage you had, but the determination, <laughs> but um, to learn to write again, to learn to speak again, all right? Uh, yes. Your movement, you are um, an example for me, how you get up every day and do your exercises. You're yeah. very good about that, right? Yeah. But when you were faced, first faced with this after the stroke and, and you have this whole road ahead of you, um, you've mentioned to me, sometimes there's anger, there's other feelings. Could you take us through some of those stages, if you will, of what you encountered and how you decided to approach that? No, it's interesting. You mentioned anger yeah i was very angry at myself how could you forget it yeah i was so determined maybe that anger that determination helped me uh, to regain to regain but right now i am forgetting the word that i you just used i wish you could tell me again the recovery recovery yeah. i think it it was that that period in which I uh, was determined indeed that uh, I should be able, and my anger too. I was angry at myself, forgetting, and the shame. This is another thing that is very, very unpleasant. And I would tell people who experience anything when they feel the loss of a function, the loss of a function. Memory is a function. This is something the, you relied on uh, as a teacher. Uh, I had to remember many things uh, from my education and so forth. And I, what I would say now, I got very angry at myself, forgetting. And I know that this, you people who are listening to me will say, oh, Anna, uh, we will forgive you. We care about you and so forth. I know you do, but I don't. I don't like myself when I am a person who forgets. And I have to accept can you under, you understand that? As you age, you will forget. And how to accept the fact that you are aging and you are forgetting. And I would suggest to you, those of you who may have to watch this program, that the difficult thing is to accept yourself with these limitations that your brain is now imposing on you. I think I made that very clear. Mark, did, you did, you did. I, was I, I making you know, it I'm, clear? You know, what I'm struck by, there's a duality here because you talk about acceptance. Yes. But you also talk about anger and fighting. So, you know, it's the fine line, the distinction between um, accepting and saying, no, you know what, I will try to do better. I can try to push it. Like when you were regaining your memory, when you were regaining your speech, Correct. that, that was not acceptance. That was, I will fight to try to re reclaim it <laughs> as best as what, I, I, as I see it, right? So mm -hmm. you have, you have this constant friction between the two, between what do you accept and what do you resist? Yeah, you know? Th this is a lovely way of making it very clear to the list listening, and also that this is a process. It doesn't happen in one uh, few in one, and uh, it it doesn't happen uh, um, now. You don't I have am. an epiphany. It doesn't happen immediately. No, no, no. As a matter of fact. Uh, it is very interesting and, and maybe it's something that I was not ex uh, uh, expecting actually that uh, this is a process that some days your memory is better than others. Mm -hmm. Then you will remember things better than another time. I think how 
you slept that night with that, uh, you know, they, and a very important, very important thing, whether or not you are in a loving, accepting environment, then your uh, feeling that the people around you are not necessarily accepting you as you are, then you don't do very well. When I feel that, for example, my family and my friends and people who had always been kind and good to me and loved me, I expect this environment, this environment, can, I am making it so clear mm. that I need to know whether I am in an, F, an environment that is accepting and loving and caring or are you here to say, find out, oh, Anna is gone, you know? She's not anymore any what she used to be. Why do they put her on a program? That is terrible. Are there people who feel that way? Then I will not do very well. So you'll languish. But to your credit, I'd like to point out, you've always been very proactive. <laughs> I mean, you have your book club, right? There are people that come in <clears throat> for everybody who knows. So I try to visit Anna once a week, and but I have to write in, in pencil in her schedule. All right. So when I look at her schedule book, I can see all the people who are in there. And you keep a very from day to day, you have at least one, maybe two people coming in to visit. So okay. and I think that's very important that the the variety of people that, the environment yeah. remains accepting and loving. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I see, like, if you were to look around her living room, books, you have <laughs> books, you're listening to music, you have people coming. Uh, so we emphasize that for, I think we all learned from this, that we need a variety of stimuli to keep oh. us going. Can I, can I ask a question? Is that is that okay? Or do you want to wait? No, no, go ahead. Um, this is Rose. I'm just wondering, you're talking about uh, not being able to remember and how difficult and upsetting that can be, are there any advantages to not being able to remember certain things uh, that maybe is hard to even conceptualize because how can you answer that question if you don't remember what it is that it's good to, to forget? But I, that just occurred to me as you were talking, I think most people who have problems with memory and I think even people who haven't had a stroke as we get older mm -hmm. our memory fades even without any right. uh, uh, diagnosable dementia right. um are there any positives about not about one's memory not being so good anymore it's an, a beautiful question. It's a very good question. And it is a very timely question. And I am going to give you an example um, uh, because that it is very remarkable and very important. Very re recently, just this last week, I lost a very dear uh, friend. We were very, very close. We talked frequently. We knew each other's histories and so forth. This uh, friend of mine uh, went through the Holocaust. She lost every member of her family, recent, uh, more than recent, uh, not recently, some time ago. Uh, she found a uh, half brother and uh, than this brother's uh, grandchild. Uh, but generally, uh, she, she was a survivor. However, and this is very interesting, this friend of mine never, ever wanted to talk about the show. She knew, for example, that I would come to New York to give a talk about the show because I talked about it quite a bit. She, however, never, she, as I mentioned, she went to Auschwitz. She was in def different camps and eventually she found a half brother, but she refused absolutely, never, not 
even in her slightest to talk about her experiences. Now that had a function, this forgetting and very deliberate forgetting about the most important event in her life was very interesting. And I must say, I had not found it in many, in any other person, but this is how she was. And she continued to live life, to enjoy things quite a bit, very much. She got married, she had children, she found great, uh, interest and not loving, but forgetting that uh, she lost her whole family was very important to her for her survival. I don't know, did I make it clear? Yeah, you're, you're talking that in, for her to go on living, she had to forget. She had to suppress it, I guess, right? Suppressing, but she was very conscious of it and she told me when I would come to New York and spend the night with her, uh, I, she didn't have to ask me because I knew already that one of the things that we will not talk about is her experiences of the past. Did but, I? But do you feel like in, when, whether it's this friend or a patient you've had many years ago, the suppression of memory does it show up somewhere else in their lives that there's a there's a cost or a balance to that, a counterbalance? It is very interesting. And you are uh, putting the light on something that I was not uh, fully uh, conscious. And I should have paid more attention the function of forgetting. I was so in, I was so determined uh, to remember as much as I possibly could that I never considered what a good function forgetting may be. That for her uh, not to remember or, or not be conscious of what her past was, was necessary for her to be able to um, experience the joy of the present. And that I often wonder whether I had done. I hope I did not. I will have to ask my children. Uh, my children feel the way that they remember their childhood, that I paid very close attention to their experiences and that I was indeed emotionally very present in their experiences and what it was important. Uh, I was singing and I was uh, telling stories and uh, yes, when they were young, uh, I, that happened. And I didn't feel that that was difficult for me. Uh, when you are young people around you and you see how beautiful they are developing, you know, when you see your child uh, taking the first steps and all of that, I was very conscious of my joy. And that is interesting, very important. And I would say that over and over, that the two emotions, the, the, the pain, the pain of your losses, we are all very conscious that we lost all, but not me personally, that in Heidelberg, where we were together as a, a group of people, we were very conscious of our losses. At the same time, when we got together, what did we do? We were singing songs. We were telling jokes. You wonder, are these people actually remembering that only a year ago, their families were already in the gas chamber. We did. And this possibility that emotions can coexist, that you can remember the terrible things that happened to your family, and at the same time, enjoy the 
you enjoy the development as you witness it in your own children mm. and how you put these two emotions together this is i think what survivors are about survivors are not only remembering the terrible past they also remember the joys that their children have caused and still does every day when you talk with them i think i need an other life in a way to figure out how emotionally that was possible or is possible but it is uh, it, it is true mm. i know i know because i had lived that that we would telling jokes and singing songs and that didn't mean that we have forgotten that our families are gone no and you 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 hadn't in another way uh, when i looked with the, your family as your children were growing up there was a point where you elected at the satyrs to tell a story Correct. and that those stories in turn became part of your book my mother's eyes and so you you, you found a way i think to not only um look at your memories but to share your memories with the next generation with your children and then to the next step to a wider audience through the book Oh, you, you are so generous, very sweet. Uh, you are my other brain <laughs> because- Well, then uh, I'm the weaker half. <laughs> <laughs> you are my yeah. other brain because you are exactly that. That reminds me <clears throat> that I, and that was not only, excuse me, uh, my own particular ability but I think that this uh, duality, mm -hmm. this two, the existence, the, the two emotions can exist, is very normal. Uh, this is a, a, a human quality. Mm -hmm. It is not mine in particular, but I think we uh, go to this uh, ability to have two very different emotions in the brain at the same time i think i'm um, live another life in order to figure that out no this, this is ahead, somebody wants to ask yeah this is this is rose again uh, um i i i you were giving the example of your friend who almost uh deliberately forgot or tried to forget about her experiences in the Holocaust. And uh, most of us, fortunately, have not had exp terrible experiences of that magnitude. So I'm thinking that what you were describing with your friend also applies or could apply to any painful or negative experience that someone had that uh, um, either consciously or unconsciously their their brain doesn't remember and some would say that's a bad thing but in many instances perhaps to a lesser degree but the same principle as your friend it it could help in carving out a good life for yourself in the future I don't I don't think there's one set answer to it. And yeah, it's yeah, funny yeah, that, yeah. that we're, we're right. talking about this right now, because earlier this morning, um, with, my wife came back from uh, walking the dog and she was with some friends and she hears a story. And this this really deals with suppression of memory. Mm -hmm. Apparently, a friend of a friend, uh, this woman was driving with her husband and there was some song that came on. And the song brought back a memory where suddenly she didn't realize that she was biting down on her lip to the point where blood spurted out. And she suddenly had this flood of memories that were suppressed about being uh, abused by family members. Is and this is something amazing? that she has suppressed for a, a few decades. Amazing. Right? And now 
she's going through a process where she's actually debilitated. She can't work, she's depressed, et cetera, but she's facing something that she had been suppressing. And so you have two, two stages of this. You have one stage where she suppressed it and went through a period of her life where she could so-called function day to day and have a family, be married, and then it comes flooding back. And, and I think it's, it's that balance of there is a price in the end, even with the suppression of what one could be potentially uh, paying, if you will. Uh, we, we were talking about depression earlier. You yep. mentioned something which you asked me in a previous conversation, um, not to forget, um, in terms of loss of function and stroke. And you talked to me about Fetterman. Do you yes. remember? Yes. And, and you were talking about the fact that he recognized he had to seek help. Yes. But there was depression. I don't know if you want to touch on that again, but you did bring it up to me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this this goes appears on to people all across the board. You have an unusual perspective, I think, on two accounts. One, your training in psychoanalysis, but also having been fortunate to live a long life and you've dealt with your own trauma through the Holocaust and loss of family. Yes. Yes. No, you really touched on many things and very important things, and I will not be able to, but I think this Federman uh, experience uh, made me realize that uh, re uh, I, I have trouble with this now because I have some difficulty to know exactly what was what was it like for him i tell you what my trouble is right now that he is a very public person in other words i think people uh, will talk about their uh, ability remember or not remember uh, that that is related how important that is for the public, for the people around you, that you can feel free to think about anything that you want to remember or not forget. But when you are in public life, I am afraid you don't have that uh, ability, not, not only ability, you don't have that freedom. Mm. You don't to, have the luxury, yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't have the luxury to know or not to know because you now have to perform and you have to put your best foot forward, so to speak. So I suspect that Featherman, when he gets to uh, listen to, uh, you know, when we are, he should, should he talk, uh, should he listen to us, uh, he would tell us, uh, sorry, ma'am, uh, I can't, I don't have the luxury uh, to talk about things openly because I am in public life and I have to behave myself in, uh, in keeping with that. Uh, am I making myself? No. And, you know, he's in a no-win situation. Any public figure... In a, in a situation like this where there'll be detractors who are saying, well, you shouldn't be a public figure. You shouldn't be in this situation. Yes. Uh, other people could say because of his role, he's shining a light on depression and getting care, which has a positive in its own way. Okay. Right. There's, there's no one set answer, of course. Yes. What I'd like to do, you talk about performance, and, and I'd like to shift to with memory. There are two things uh, you wrote that I, I would like to, um, to quote you on. One is that you wrote the following. In ghettos in particular. This is me talking. This is you. This is you writing. Writing? Yeah, and talking to us, okay. Yeah. Uh, in ghettos in particular, cultural activities provided opportunities to strengthen internalized values and ideas, ideals, excuse me, when the need for such values was greater than ever. The capacity to preserve deeply internalized values meant that degraded and physically and emotionally abused prisoners 
could retain their sense of continuity, and this is very important, that reached into their past and could potentially be transmitted to future generations. And you then cite in another paper, and this is very brief, but you refer to one of our dear friends, the painter Sam Bach, right? Yes, yes. And you write, Bach's pictures are quote, not renditions of how things appear, but tributes to disappearance, absence, rather than presence. All right. So thinking about- You have to explain that to me now. <laughs> <laughs> so, I know I wrote it, yeah. but you know, my cap uh, ability uh, to say things so well, yeah. as I did some years ago, I can no longer do that. Well, would you do it when we schmooze each week? Okay, so we will continue it here too. But yes. so you, you, we talked about um, writers um, and painters, painters okay, yeah. musicians, composers, all right, right, all right. And there are those who created during the Holocaust. Yes. And then there were those who were fortunate to have survived and continue to create. Correct. And then we have one other category, which are those who did not live it. But afterwards, a generation subsequent, or maybe two generations now or three, that people look upon this and it inspires their work or it infuses them a good portion of the work. They yes. touch on issues, right? I mean, I think Sam Bach, when you look at his paintings, um, what do they say to you? Because you know his work and you know him and his life experiences in the Holocaust. Yes. No, I can tell you only because I had known him all his years that, first of all, he's an extremely gifted artist. He started to paint when he was eight or nine years old. And so this method uh, painting was available to Sam Bach uh, in a way that other people don't have that. And he was able to express emotions and feelings with painting. And he did not only depend on words. And I think this is the advantage that uh, artists have all together, that they have more than one way of expressing uh, or communicating ideas. Let me put it so that people know what I mean, that artists have more than one way to communicate what they feel and what they think. And I think that that is the advantage of a painter uh, and he had that opportunity since age nine. Mm. He has been right, uh, no, let me just say that, he, he has been painting, but then he wrote a book. I wonder, did you see that book by... Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful memoir. It's very beautifully written. Oh, yeah. it is unbelievable. <clears throat> it is called uh, uh, Painting in Words. Yes. Perfect, painting in words. So he had more than one way to communicate what he felt and what he thought. He could express beautifully in the book um, in words. And then he had naturally mm. his ability yes. to paint it in words. Uh, the, the book yeah, is called is Painting in Words. We're, we're hearing some bleed over. Can you make sure you're muted? And and Mark, there was a question in the chat, or someone's got their hand raised. So yeah. You have to decide when you want to take questions. We can we can take them as we go along. Sure. Okay. I think it was Leah who had her hand up. Oh, that was a mistake, but I'm I'm listening. Thank you. Okay. So I want to go back to Sam's work because um he changed it in his style and approach in painting. It was a pivotal period where he he writes about it as well, but speaks quite often about this, where he goes to images and symbolism is a very important part of his paintings, as you probably can recall, yes, like yes. the pears, the chess pieces, yes, yes. Um, the broken figures, um, you know, and then he has all the symbolism, which is quite rich. And he found a whole new expression that really was his outpouring of his past. 
-hmm. what he experienced. No, uh, but I want to tell you uh, that Sam uh, was a very gifted artist. And some artists are very good in telling you what they meant when they painted this thing or that thing. Sam had the ability to express himself with words just as good as in painting. When we read the book, I remember reading the book with Paul together, said, my God, this man could have been a writer. He was so gifted with words. I think the book ended up being called Painting in Words. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is because Sam was so gifted. I know many painters who have no idea what they had in mind when they painted this uh, picture or that. They didn't. And I remember them and asked them, I know. And when you I, look at his paintings, what's remarkable, I think, <clears throat> they can speak to you, of course, because of, these are images of a lost world. He's, he's reminding us of the world that was lost. Uh, and then for somebody like myself or people that are <clears throat> a generation or two removed, it's still there is the humanity. All right. There is the loss of that, the loss of a community, the loss of the I individuals. Think he's particularly good at that what you just said because he creates and recreates and recreates that lost word with so many words and in so many images so when you are gifted like that that you are gifted with the symbols mm -hmm. and also at the same time uh, with words uh, then you have it, <laughs> you really have it, mm. because you are able to express yourself both ways. Now, actually, at the end, I think if you would ask Sam himself, he would tell you that his preference is painting. And the words are wonderful that he has such good gift to tell us also the story in words, but as if, words are secondary to the paint thing and the paint yes do yeah. i make it yeah. i don't know that we have to ask but as a painter and he reminds me i i'm actually preparing a lecture um which touches on guernica the painting by picasso the guernica. Yeah. yes yes <clears throat> and in fact he was asked over and over again about the symbolism etc yes and, and he would come back consistently basically stating you find the symbols all right. He may he says, I may find that too with you to some degree, but it is still the painting I created and the elasticity of the this work or any given work of art, whether you're reading something, you're listening to music or it, it will give something of that past, perhaps, but it functions also it functions also on a higher level that yeah. it's open for interpretation. Yes, but I want to tell you, uh, Mark, that I had asked many uh, artist, mm. what does your painting mean? What, what, what did you want to say mm. with this painting? They don't know. Mm. Much of it is unconscious. It's very interesting and kind of uh, very funny. I, I who, I uh, love words. <laughs> And I always use words to express myself. But I find that there are artists who cannot find the words to express what they had in mind. Oh, maybe my unconscious had it in mind. But Sam was very gifted. He had it both. Mm -hmm. He had the symbols. He had his paintings. At the same time, when it came to publishing a book, the book is full with beautiful descriptions that an, uh, an a writer would want. Mm -hmm. So he was so gifted that he could express himself in painting and in words, just 
as well. Mm. Maybe not just as well, <clears throat> but because you, you... he preferred to do it in, in the painting, yeah. Mm. But you you do it in, in your book in words, and, and you actually um, cross disciplines from psychoanalysis to being the survivor who recounts in the stories. Um, there's one section I'd like to read where I think there's something very inspiring about this, and it must have been inspiring when you first shared this at the Seder table with your family. Let me just read this section. And this is from one of my favorite stories, The Core of an Apple. Okay. <laughs> Many people love it. Yeah. So if you indulge me, let, let me just read this section so we can set the tone and then we'll discuss it. This was January 1945, close to my 18th birthday. All right. But more often than not, we talked about food. All right. And go on to talk. We were in the middle of a cold winter and in the middle of what felt like an endless war. But miracles do happen. Somehow my mother found the core of an apple. She found it, I believe, on the street close to the camp. On the way back from the train, we took every day to the factory. We saved the core of the apple for my birthday. And what a present it was. You put an exclamation mark there. There was... <clears throat> Uh, there were a few good bites left on the core. I wanted her to share it with me, but she insisted that it was my birthday, and so I ate it all. I still love apples more than any other kind of fruit. My family often teases me about how I eat an apple with such obvious relish and how I always eat it completely. No part of it ever gets thrown away. What my family may not realize is that I am looking forward to eating the core, that I love the core the best. Eating it always raises my spirits and renews my belief in miracles. <laughs> it's a great way to end a story, but it's the spirit of the book. When we talk about memory and how you make a miracle out of it, what you choose to do. And, and I think you operate like all these other op that reading that can be interpreted on so many things. What is the core? Not just the apple. And then if we go biblical, think about the apple from the tree of knowledge. Oh my God, yes, indeed. All right, the apple, yes. the tree of knowledge. Yes. To bite into yes, it. Yes, all right. I wish I thought of that. And you, with your great intellect, you devour the apple, all right? <laughs> yeah. You see, you need an, interpre an interpreter uh, for any story. Uh, I wish you would have been there at the Seda table to finish this story because you have a perfect ending for it. Well, it'll be at my Seder table. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh -huh. That will be wonderful. But you know, the core of the apple, this particular story in my book, is one that is read more often than any others. Many people just love this story. The fact that my mother had found at the core of an apple so in the middle of the winter and that she saved it for me. And, and that since, since then, I eat an apple uh, with a great relish and great delight. Uh, yeah, I do love apples a great deal. Mm -hmm. Yes. I can go on with uh, some other points, but at this point, are there any questions or comments that uh, you can share with us? This is the one thing I don't like about Zoom, the Zoom silence when nobody answers and you're... Yeah? <laughs> Thank yeah, you. I'm, uh, um, I think it's very important to note that Judaism is a religion that is based on memory. Yes. Some even say nostalgia. Right? Everything that we do in Judaism is a reflection of something that was done before. And like the, like the Bible says, there's nothing new under the sun. Another point that I wanted to make, and I think this is fascinating. When I was living in Israel, I was commissioned to translate the Glass Menagerie by Tennessee Williams into Hebrew. 
for those of you who have seen the play, you may remember that in the opening monologue, the actor says, the play is memory. Mm. And there are at least 250 different editions of the play based upon the memory that the author had when he was writing it, which made translation very, very difficult because I can only <laughs> pick one of those. But just the idea that memory changes as we age. And I think that I, right now I am dealing with my own mortality and dealing with your own mortality, your issues of memory become very, very real. And I will not forget a single memory right now. I'm not ready to let go. <laughs> mm. Is this famous? I can't, we yes. can't see this week. Okay. No. So that, that's an interesting point, the, the, um, the, the different stages of a given memory. Correct. Have you, have you experienced that? Can you, no, does something uh, come to mind? Probably I did, but I did not uh, realize what was happening. In other words, uh, the person who just spoke mm. uh, was telling me, that in Judaism, everything is dependent how well we remember or how we remember. I don't know whether I'm saying it that. And this is now the big question. This is a new question I'm saying. You know, we have certain, we have exactly a certain, uh, uh, we have uh, holidays, Passover, Yom Kippur, uh, the new um, year, mm -hmm. and I often wonder where the Shoah, this event, uh, rec uh, recognized, or, or is it important enough in that very long old history that Judaism is based on? When will it have the status of becoming a holiday? Mm -hmm. I often think about it because at the moment uh, we remember, oh, uh, we, we recall the Shoah when uh, the when the uh, ghetto was mm -hmm. destroyed in Warsaw. Warsaw, yeah. That is one of them. Uh, these are mem based on current memories, and I don't know will that be. Uh, the time when uh, some scholars will say, now this had come to the level of being memorated as a holiday. Will the show yeah. ever have that, that status. status? Right, and you, you, it brings up uh, a few points on, on uh, holidays, all right? Because yes. I, I think in terms of memory, holidays are a way for us to mark, well, of course we have certain Jewish holidays that are around what was an agrarian culture. Yeah. They'd mark the seasons, right? Yeah. But then we have things like Yom Kippur, self-introspection, et cetera, yes. uh, the Seder, um, emancipation, right? But having these markers through the year, I think are ways for us to moor, if you will, our memories that we can store them and we keep it rather than having one day blur into the next, to the next, to the next. Yes. So there is a, some kind of function there on another level. It's bringing community or family together too, to create yeah. memories. No, this is another important, maybe it wasn't said in your, that most of the holidays in our Jewish tradition are not uh, connected with uh, going to, uh, synagogue or a prayer, it is uh, that we remember the holiday by sitting around the table mm. and talking about the events like Passover mm. and many other uh, that, uh, no, Yom Kippur, we have to go to temple. But I think that uh, in the Jewish tradition, many uh, holidays are celebrated in the home rather than related to the synagogue. Mm. But you know, you know, I have to ask. No, what were you going to say, Emma's? Yeah, no, I was going to, if I can, I was going to add, I first look so grateful for such a rich and inspiring conversation. 
and the two the two things that I'm kind of feeling and thinking at the same time um, is when you talked about feeling shame at the loss of function um, and how I think that gets more complex, particularly when we're instructed never to forget. So um, when we grow, grow up with, with your experience, your real and true experience, and then for, for us as listeners to survivors, um, and it's surrounded by the instruction never to forget, I think that gets, gets complex around the feelings of shame if in fact naturally we're losing function. And that ties to me too, just to say briefly, that as you talked about um, remembering within the context of holidays in the family, that we were teaching our children how to understand and to use memory. Um, that it, memory might be, it's simply, it's there, it's a, it's a biological function, but that we need to learn, we do learn to need how to remember, um, how not to forget, and sometimes at holidays, it's, as children, it's through eavesdropping, through overhearing, but sometimes it also needs, I think, instruction um, and encouragement. Mm. Very lovely comments, very beautiful, really. Uh, you know, I don't know how to respond other than it comes kind of natural. Uh, maybe I can just tell you, how I experienced this moment uh, that uh, uh, that helped me remember or not helped me. It just it was the moment that I would remember a story or an event in my own life. Uh, that was a moment interesting. Uh, I don't think that would happen in other other people's lives in that way, but I know that. Uh, after the meal, uh, you know, to say that it takes a long time before people finally get to eat mm. and they are pretty hungry. And I know that it is that time at the after the meal when the children are a little bit bored and the little, you know, they had heard enough and they want to go and play. And it is this time, I know for sure that was, and I was fairly conscious of the absence of the children, that I would remember a particular uh, event in my own life. I remember uh, when, uh, when my mother gave me the cap uh, apple that I, we mm. were talking about, and uh, I, I didn't probably want to talk about uh, this kind of any event. This was not necessarily a particularly uh, bad memory, but there were many uh, where I would have preferred that the children are not around because I would remember things that were particularly painful and difficult to talk about. But I know that once the children uh, ate and uh, they were bored and they wanted to leave, uh, I would take that time uh, to tell uh, the rest of the group um, a memory that was particularly painful or difficult to talk about. I know that, mm. I know that, I remember that. And so I imagine that we are all conscious of the fact that some memories are easier to remember than others. There were many, many. And memory, um, it strikes me, is also to remember is possibly an opportunity to process, to interpret. Absolutely. And so over time, the memory Absolutely. changes because of Absolutely. what's its meaning or impact is in your life. Yeah. All right. And then for those of us who have not experienced it, remembering, well, we learned something to give value within humanity. Correct. It changes something about our own inner humanity, right? Very uh -huh. nice. There are, there are so many levels to memory that can be quite beneficial, but are also a challenge too. 
it, it doesn't come without a price, you know, and if you don't put the work in, you cannot reap the benefits of it as well. But uh, I, the limited time we have, um, I want to thank you for having a very honest, candid and inspiring conversation. As always, you're warm and welcoming to all of us. And um, it's a delight to be in your, your company. Oh, Mark, thank Mark. you. Thank you. Mark, for, uh, I just wanted to thank Mark because Mark. I believe he is creating this situation because he looked through my book and found all the passages that would be relevant and interesting for discussion. And I must thank you because Mark is really the creator of these programs. And I have to thank him for helping me to remember and to be with him. Well, you know what the best thank you is? <laughs> we have a part three oh. in, in, later in the year. How's that? Okay. Oh, that'll be wonderful. All right. oh, we'll, we'll, meet you that. we'll meet you again. And Amos, you know, you touched on translation. And um, that's going to be part of part three. You've already given me an idea. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> okay. So uh, if you don't mind me bothering you, I'm going to call you up and pull you into this. Okay. All right. So thank I, thank, you. I thank you all for showing up.